Well, good morning again. I hope you've enjoyed your coffee break. I know it's very short. Anyway, we are now going to our third session. It's called the OOKP Part 1. And my co-chair, uh, Johnny Falcinelli, will be delivering the keynote talk. Johnny. Good morning to everyone. Professor Fukuda, thanks for your kind invitation. It's a great honor for me to be here today. Um, so we, we start. Uh, MOKP is a biological keratoprosthesis. It's the only keratoprosthesis together with the temprano tibial keratoprosthesis, uh, which uses as haptic for the optic cylinder, a uh, biological haptic. In our case, the haptic is a, an osteodental lamina made of living human tissue. That is uh, a tooth taken out of the blind patient. You see the lamina already with the cylinder. And this just being planted in the eye. It was invented by Benedetto Strampelli uh, more than 50 years ago in Rome and modified by us in Rome since 1973. For this reason, we prefer to name the procedure MOOKP, that is Modified Osteodontokeratoprosthesis. This is a final result. The indications of the procedure. Bilateral corner blindness in all cases of severe damage of the ocular surface, dry eye final stage, very vascularized corneas, limbal stem cells loss. And we see the pathologies in details. And this is a uh, nice scheme uh, which was uh, presented as a few years ago at the AAO. And it's very, very interesting because it gives us the complete idea of the pathologies and of the treatment of the, the same we see that at the end of the game, the OKP is the only procedure which is indicated. We see our pathologies, Pemphigoid, Steven Johnson, Lyle, Tacoma, Graft, Os disease, Burns, and Seroderma pigmentosum. And in, in main groups, the main pathologies. We see that um, the two main groups are dry eyes and burns. Our cases end to the end of 2014 because uh, since then the National Italian uh, Service uh, doesn't supply any more uh, our need for general anesthesia in the, uh, in the Rome hospital. So the cases end to the end of 2014. In case of severe simbolepharon, before uh, starting the procedure on the eye, we have to remove it, of course. The eye is completely covered and hidden by the membranes. So we must discover the eye. In the first stage of the procedure, uh, the iris is always totally removed. The lens is always taken out, even if it's transparent with the cryo extraction. And an anterior vitrectomy is performed, abundant anterior vitrectomy. 
This is an exceptional case. It's the only case in all, uh, in all hours where the iris and the lens were left in place. This because the patient was very young. She had a congenital glaucoma. And moreover, she could not undergo general anesthesia. So it's the only case with, with uh, iris and lens left in place. In all the other cases, iris and lens are taken out. This is the preparation of the anterior part of the eye. The muscles are taken. And this is the superficial keratectomy, included the Bowman's membrane. We harvest a large piece of buccal mucosa. We prefer to use the gum mucosa. Strampelli started using the, the palatal mucosa, but we prefer the gum mucosa, which is thicker and more vascularized. It's about three centimeters diameter. And the anterior surface of the eye is covered by the mucosa. I always prepare the osteodental lamina. From a monoradicular tooth, we prefer to use a canine, upper or inferior. Uh, we, an incisor could you be used as well. In rare cases, we, we use um, monoradicular premolar, but with one, one root. We mark the precut, and this is the what we call the osteodental block, just taken out of the mouth. This is the blade we use for this purpose. This is the osteodental block, which is thinned and cleaned to obtain the lamina. We can see how the preparation is going on. We must discover the pulp canal. These are the tools we use for diamond blades for the uh, trephination of the lamina. This is the lamina. This is the dentin face, avascular, which will be in contact with the cornea. And this is the bone face. You see, the two sides are very different, one from each other. This is the lamina. It can be of various dimensions. It depends on the size of the tooth, of course. Here we see the PMA cylinder. The Strampelli one and ours at the beginning was very uh, small, uh, 1.5, even 1.2 millimeters. This is the second generation of cylinders, and this is the present generation. The optic is fixed to the lamina with resin, acrylic resin. We see the lamina with the cylinder. We see fresh blood taken from the patient is uh, blood taken from the arterial because there is more oxygen in the arterial blood. This is the lamina prepared, ready to be buried in the pocket. So we've got the osteodental block with its anatomy, the osteodental lamina, which is the block uh, um, 
smooth and cleaned and prepared for the cylinder. And the osteodental acrylic lamina, acrylic because the cylinder is in, in, in inserted in it. So the osteodental acrylic lamina is buried in the subcutaneous pocket. We see the pocket for about three months. After three months, we, you can see the cylinder there, the lamina is taken out, is covered by flabby tissues, it's cleaned, leaving a very, very uh, narrow edge of flabby tissues on its edge, useful to pass the suture in for the implant. The final stage, we transilluminate the cornea to, uh, to find out the, the center of the cornea, which is not always very easy. This is the lamina being pressed over the, the eye. We need to be two surgeons, two surgeons at least or even three surgeons in this phase, which is very delicate. This is the final result after about one month from the operation. This, again, the anatomy. This is the focal point of the technique. Uh, we create in the eye the same uh, situation which is in the mouth. That's the secret of the duration, that's the secret of the low endophthalmitis rate. And uh, Strampelli couldn't know this. We found it out with histological studies, which demonstrate that the epithelium of the buccal mucosa joins, unites, with the dento-alveolar ligament creating a real seal of the anterior chamber. That's the secret of the technique. And that's why the results are so good. These are before and after. Final results with cosmetics. In some cases of lack of buccal mucosa, we, have ob we are obliged to cover the implant with skin. We know in these cases, the duration is uh, lower and the risks of complications is higher. And that's, that's why uh, in these cases, we must follow up the patients more frequently. And this happens because there is no uh, epithelium of the buccal mucosa, but there is skin. For the reason I just told, told you before. Complication. There are many and all can be treated. And the important uh, is they are detected early and they are treated by a capro surgeon. If these are detected early and well treated, very often, main, mainly of these complications can be cured. We see the, an erosion of the buccal mucosa just near the cylinder. This was an endophthalmitis. We are doing a vitrectomy after having removing the implant. We see reabsorption of the lamina. Expulsion in a case of skin covering. This is another quite frequent complication. We see a 
little part of the bone which comes out of the mucosa. It can be easily cured. We drill the bone and we perform a plastic of the mucosa. I remember the first case was, which was done in, uh, in Miami with Dr. Victor Perez. Uh, the, the result was excellent. The patient didn't go back for follow-up and she, she, she lost the eye because she turned to Dr. Perez when the, the lamina was nearly expelled. So that was a pity. You see, our cases end to the 2014 because uh, December 2014, we stopped making the procedures in Rome. This for lack of organization by the general hospital. We see the, what we call the usual views of acuity. It's a high percentage. Visual acuity useful, it's um, um, visual acuity which, which uh, permits to the patient to having sometimes a working activity or any way to be independent. A low rate of hypovision and a lower rate of blindness. 10-10 we mean in, is 20-20. This is the longest follow-up. Uh, this woman was attacked by um, a friend <laughs> in 1978, the lamina. This is the scan of the lamina, which is still in excellent conditions. So the follow-up is 35 years. The patient still, she's still doing well, she still has uh, good vision. And this is the longest follow-up of our cases. This is an, another of our cases, a bilateral patient. We see the left lamina is mainly reabsorbed. The right one is okay. Follow-up is 25 years. And he had a normal working activity in the fashion factory of Valentino's. We can see the optic disc through the cylinder. And we can perform a uh, visual field examination. In case the tooth is too small, we can use two teeth joint. This was done in five cases, that is uh, approximately 1.5% of all our cases. We use the same acrylic resin to join the two tooth, the two half lamina. So five cases of all ours. This is quite interesting. It's a case of apparent edentulia. Apparently, the, the, this woman had no tooth, no teeth available. But she told us that many years before she had done an X-ray, and the dentist told her there was something there. We repeated the X-ray, and we found out there was, you see it there, there was a hidden tooth, an in impacted tooth, which were used that was the bone repaired, and it was used successfully for MOKP. So that's the very important question. What to do when there are no teeth? We've got various options. We can use a blood relation, and then the other options. In 15 cases, of our, uh, we used 
um, blood relation tools taken from a biocompatible relative, uh, usually father to, to son or no, son to, to sister to brother, or, and performing before a tissue typing, uh, studying the HLA histocompatibility, studying uh, the antigens of, of first and second class. That's very important. To have the best biocompatibility, histocompatibility. And the immunologist suggested to us to, uh, to give the patient uh, a low dosage of cyclosporin for six months. We, we did so. We don't know if it, if it was useful or anyway, we, we, we followed the, the advice of the immunologist. And we could suppose, we could suppose the duration and the, the strength of the implant in this case could be, could be less, but there, there is no scientific proof of this. The tibial bone is uh, invented by Temprano in the 90s in, in Spain. It's biological. We have no experience using this device. We believe being a biological device is, is reliable. And then the Boston K-Pro type 1 and type 2. Very kindly, a few years ago, Dr. Chodos came to Rome, bringing the devices, and he, he taught us how to perform the, the procedure. And we did a patient with his supervision. Uh, the patient did well for the first year, then he was lost for the follow-up. And if we see patients suitable for the procedure, we do not perform it by ourselves. We, we send these patients to colleagues in Italy who do this procedure. One is in Rome, the other is in the north of Italy. Boston type 2 uh, improved is its results as well as the, uh, the Boston type 1, especially in this last decade with the use of cyclo of uh, contact length and uh, vancomycin. This is a very important paper published in the archives in 2005 with the analysis uh, of the results. It was an independent survey made by Professor Falsini. And this is uh, another very important paper published in uh, Cornea in 2005 as well. The Rome Vienna Protocol. It is what Gunther Gabner calls the gold standard for the procedure. Uh, it's what every surgeon who is going to perform the MOKP should, uh, should have in mind. Gunther Gabner. Conradil Cogliardo from Rome, and my twin brother, Christopher Leo, two other colleagues, and this is Giancarlo. Everyone looks much younger. This is the present and the future of the MOKP in South America, and this was taken in 2013 in Jean-Marie Parel's office in Miami at Bascom Palmas. This is Dr. Ernesto Otero of the Bogota Baraque Clinic, Jean Marie, the director of the project. And this is the Dr. Gomez, the maxillo surgeon. They are very young but very, very skilled. Three cases were performed with good results. The first one I was there, the other two they were done independent by the Colombian team with good results. We see again 
these very problematic eyes. These are the laminae used for the procedure. Results. And so I finished and just in time. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Johnny, my twin brother. So now we've actually run out of time. So because the uh, ensuing talks are on the related matters, then may, may I um, ask that uh, you return here with me and we proceed with the next talk and then take questions later. So the next talk is um, Dr. Fukuda, please, uh, on a case of um, severe facial thermal burn treated with the MOOKP. Thank you. Uh, good morning again. Uh, next, my talk is a case of severe facial thermal burn treated with MOKP. This is our department hospital. Uh, other, let me introduce uh, about Kindai University. Uh, Kindai University is a unique private university, one of the largest universities in Western Japan, uh, famous about Kindai Tuna first successful full-cycle aquaculture. That is a Kindai tuna. And uh, very fatty and very tasty. And uh, also, now recently changed our uh, university name from Kinki to Kindai. Uh, the reason why you know that. <laughs> uh, we are set, set up MOKP Center in Japan. And uh, it's our history. So Christopher, uh, ex introduce some of them. Uh, I met uh, Christopher Liu in 1999. At that time, uh, uh, so, sorry, uh, 2000, uh, uh, 1999, Professor Shimomura, my boss here, uh, joined the Kindai University and uh, started the uh, K-Pro study with many companies. This is not uh, continued. And uh, year 2000, uh, Dr. Kazuo Tsubota holds the uh, Asia Colonial Society meeting in Tokyo. At that time, I met uh, Mr. Christopher Liu at the first time and the new MOOKP, and I was shocked the, about the very good result. And uh, the same year, uh, I had the chance to visit Brighton and study stage two. And the year 2001, I invited Chris Varyu to Japan, Japanese Colonial Society meeting, and uh, see, see my first, very first patient. Uh, and uh, May 2001, I visited Brighton again with Dr. Hamada, a dental surgeon. Uh, he is coming here and also presenting the poster there. And, um, and, and de dental surgeon, I learned the dental part with uh, Jim Herald here. Uh, much younger Christopher, uh, much also me. And, uh, and uh, 2001, and we applied the ethical committee at Kindai University and approved. We are ready to do the surgery. And the 2002, attend the MOKP course at Brighton. At that time, I first saw uh, Giancarlo Facinelli, the founder. Uh, in Japan, uh, as uh, in the, the many countries, so, so this MOKP is very attractive for the media. The so various media release, TV shows 2004, 2005, 2008, 2010. Uh, this is in, in introduced incredible visual recovery surgery using patient own tooth. Uh, this is in Japanese newspaper, and uh, this is uh, internal Kindai University newsbook. Uh, today I'd like to show uh, my uh, case, case uh, 32 years old male, severe facial and upper body thermal burn grade three by traffic accident in 2004 at, at the age of 23. The patient was treated widely 
by skin graft, including the facial part. Right eye was totally covered by the skin, and uh, including uh, right eye was totally covered by skin. Left eye was uh, confirmed. I can see the eye moving, but no palpable tissues like this right perception and hand motion. Uh, ultrasound looks good and uh, uh, relatively normal ERG and VEP, so we decided to do the surgery. Uh, 2014, uh, December, OKB stage one. So the lung uh, quite smooth, no problem making OKB lamina using upper left canine tooth, uh, no problem identifying ocular surface and the rectal muscle taking the mucous membrane and the sugaring on the ocular surface like this. The, on the stage two, there are, there are problems. Taking out the OKP lamina from lower part of the left eye, I, I found the melting of the denting with, with dropout, very loose optical cylinder was noted during the OKP lamina preparation. So we cannot do uh, continue the surgery, so I asked uh, Dr. Hamad to call him back and the uh, refixation of the optical cylinder and dentin hole with dental cement followed by the development inside the hole and uh, around the optical cylinder. A little bit loose, but it succeeded. And uh, we put it back to the, under the skin and uh, scheduled the second stage in two weeks' time. And two weeks' time, second time surgery, the taking out the OK lamina without any optical cylinder disorder this time, the well fixed, and the adhesion with iris tissue. So in the uh, ocular part, adhesion with iris tissue and the corneal tissue, and extraction of the few white masses, no, no lens, no iris, without uh, any crystalline lens too. So I assume the uh, major perforation and melting of the lens and, and healed. And uh, so I decided to cutting the proliferative membrane followed by cutting the vitreous. Uh, we can uh, reach the vitreous. Uh, no, pro no problem in searching OK pyramina and suturing. A clinical course after stage two surgery, uh, unfortunately vitreous hemorrhage was there, but, but it recovers two months time, so we can see the optic disc, but severe optic nerve atrophy with uh, mild ocular and retina degeneration. Visual acuity after operation remained hand motion, same as uh, that before operation. So uh, patient disappointed me too. A summary of this case, we performed OKP in a severe thermal burn case. We experienced dropout of the optical cylinder due to um, merited denting, and we managed this drop-up problem by the development of hole and cylinder and refixation of it, and then the cement and proceed the, proce uh, proceed the procedure to, to the end. The visual acuity is not recovered because of severe optic nerve atrophy. Severe secondary glaucoma with coronary melting, perforation, lens damage, inflammation, and angular adhesion was suspected. In this case, ERG and VEP before operation did not reflect the visual prognosis in this case. Uh, I've done, we, we have done seven cases in 13 years, uh, very small numbers. And uh, I, let me show some result. Uh, two, two SJAs, three SJAs in, in series, the first three cases, the so, um, best Visual acuity 1.2, 0.6, 0 0.2, and uh, current visual acuity is here. So fairly long time follow-up, over 12 years. And this, uh, this patient lost follow-up. And one OCP patient, uh, visual acuity 0 0.2, remain 0 0.04 because of uh, large coloboma there. And, uh, Case five with the chemical burn, and best VA is 1.2, and uh, we we experienced the severe glaucoma after four years, so shunt, tube shunt surgery, so it remained. Uh, one SGS 
58 male, 1.2. This is the best result so far. And the, this case is the case I showed today. Unfortunate, so visual acuity did not recover. Thank you very much. Would you like questions now or later? Uh, now, please. Are there any questions for uh, Dr. Fukuda? Uh, my name is uh, Inatomi, coming from Kyoto Prefecture University of Medicine, and uh, congratulations for the great your success of the OKP in Japan. Uh, we are very proud of you because uh, we still have some severe patient even in Japan, and that you provide a very nice chance to receive this surgery. My uh, question is, uh, you, uh, we, I'm, we have many uh, potential patient in Japan, but uh, we don't know uh, how many uh, uh, potential patients in Japan. Uh, can you estimate the potential number of the potential of the patients in Japan, or uh, how will you uh, provide the more information to uh, give the uh, good uh, chance for these patients. Do you have any uh, fellow, uh, future directions? I don't have the right answer, but uh, corneal specialists in Japan maybe have few patients. So in total, maybe few few hundred patients are there. And uh, uh, at the, uh, two, three years after I start the operation, so the media release, so everybody are interested. But now not many people are interested, unfortunately. But uh, so at, at that time, I, I have uh, several patients referred to me. And uh, so some, some cases, some cases uh, g gave up for recovery, visual recovery, some mentality things. And also uh, some, some patients don't have the support people to come to the hospital and also old age, and that, that is another problem. And also the third problem is that no, no teeth left for, for the surgery. So I, I don't know why the number in, in Japan uh, is not like uh, uh, UK or India or Singapore, uh, but uh, I think some factors, so some uh, mental factor too. Well, I, I, I expecting more, more patient. So after this meeting, and just a quick question, Anna, is it easy to uh, keep the uh, good uh, technical quality even you have a surgery not so frequently? Ah, oh, yeah, that's a good question. But uh, so um, first three cases I was helped by Mr. Liu, but after that I, I independent to do. So now, now I'm confident, quite confident to do that. Thank you very much. I have a comment. Ask, ask your chairman about the mel melting of the dentin. Uh, have you seen some something before? Dentin losing dentin. No, we didn't. We had um, resorption of the lamina, but mainly of the bone part. Yes, the bone part. No, uh, at the stage two. I found a loose optical cylinder. I was surprised to see. Have, have you seen that case before? <laughs> At the stage two. Yes, we had some. We had some. I, I, I cannot tell you how many, but we had some. Can I make a comment here uh, regarding the uh, Loosening of the cylinder, was it just a loosening or was there an actual widening of the uh, opening that you had drilled? Did you cement back the same cylinder or did you have to use a slightly larger cylinder? Ah, uh, uh, so same cylinder, for, fortunately. So yeah, a bit so loose, but it's okay. So if that was the scenario, then it's unlikely that um, 
there was a resorption that had occurred which was responsible for the loosening of mm. the cylinder. It's we know how spare cylinder at that time. So <laughs> we have to yeah, fix so it again. Yeah, so we have not really had the situation during the primary stage too. But when we do have, we, we have had uh, a trauma related, I think I have a talk tomorrow, where um, fortunately there was just a loosening of the cylinder and we were able to re-cement uh, the same uh, cylinder to the same opening. But sometimes if you actually have a resorption and you need to um, uh, make that opening a little more uniform, then you would need a slightly larger cylinder to be ordered and uh, re-cemented, in which situation we order for the new cylinder and place the lamina back in the cheek and then re-cement it the next time. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, um, uh, Professor Liu and uh, Dr. Hill whether you would do it in the same um, sitting, like we have placed the cylinder back in the eye rather than putting it back into the cheek for two weeks and then placing it. And if you're cementing it um, intraoperatively, we just wait for some time and then place um, the lamina in the eye. So what would be the opinion of the experts here? So, so we haven't got much time, so very, very briefly, I think um, I, I've had one case as well uh, at uh, stage two that I found that the cylinder was loose and I uh, used cement to put it back together and I didn't have the courage to carry on with stage two because I wanted to find out uh, in due course whether the cement would hold. And I think there are various factors. Um, I think if that should take place, is it would be either because the original hole is on the large side, because the cement is not an adhesive, it's just a filler, uh, or um, it's been subject to trauma, or maybe even the pockets being too tight, because um, if you push from the anterior part, it can go back, whereas um, on the other hand, from the back forwards, it cannot come forward. Um, so so I, I, was not, I was a coward, and I didn't dare to carry on with stage two. Thanks. So we go on with the next presentation. Dr. Mohamed Bagat Goweda from Egypt, Alexandria. Please. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to present my early experience in OQP in Egypt. Uh, first, I would like to express my gratitude uh, to my mentor and friend, Professor Christopher Liu, who taught me this procedure. Without his continuous guidance and encouragement, this work would have not been accomplished. The first case was a 60-year-old female with a catarizing conjunctivitis of unknown etiology, blind since five years, no previous ocular surgery, vision, hand movement, and the ultrasound was free. Stage one was done. However, breaking of the canine was uh, uh, occurred, and we harvested from uh, the lamina from the upper incisors. There was a central hematoma, which progressed to an aquatic infected area. It needed a second intervention where I, where I removed the whole necrotic area from the central part of uh, the buccal mucous membrane. And then did a releasing incision in the superior part to create a sliding flap or a bactantal flap to cover the, cent the central area from the superior part of the buccal mucous membrane. After covering the central area, I harvested uh, another part of a labial mucous membrane to cover the per superior part.
and to have this appearance at the end. This uh, worked okay, and I proceeded with uh, stage two, which was really uh, uneventful, uh, creating the refinution, aversion of the iris, cryo extraction of the lens, performing anterior vitrectomy. and then fixing uh, the small lamina to the sclera, covering then again with the buccal mucous membrane and performing a small uh, definition for the patient to see from. The post-operative period was uneventful apart from some vitreous hemorrhage in the early post-operative uh, period. Best corrected visual acuity was 0.4 after five months. The second case was that of an 83 young male with severe cicatrizing conjunctivitis, previous corneal grafts, amniotic membrane transplantation, lead surgeries. He is on medical treatment for glaucoma. Visual vision was PL. Visual evoked potential was done twice by different operators and revealed a functioning visual pathway. Uneventful stage one and two was done. However, visual equity didn't improve and remain PL. After three months, the patient lost this PL with a retention of the prosthesis. The third case was a 67-year-old male with Jurgen syndrome previous corneal graft, amniotic membrane transplantation, on glaucoma treatment, and the vision was hand movement. Uneventful stage one and two, visual equity improved to 0.2. One month post-operative, the buccal mucous membrane was eroded with a small area of bone exposure. This required a second intervention, which I performed cutting, uh, removing the buccal mucous membrane around uh, the export area and doing a leasing incision sphere. It is the same idea as the previous case, undermining the buccal mucous membrane to slide this to cover the bone, grinding of the exposed bone, and then suturing it and leaving the pale upper part to granulate. Six months post-operative, visual acuity was 0.3, buccal mucous membrane was covering the area of previous exposure. So as a conclusion, OKP was successfully performed in three Egyptian patients with with end-stage corneal blindness. Satisfactory visual outcome was achieved in two patients. Proper selection of cases as well as adequate training of maxillofacial surgeon is a crucial step for a successful beginning. Thank you. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. Another brother of mine. Younger brother. <laughs> uh, next uh, talk is by uh, Dr. Dilapath, uh, OKP using living related donors in cases of um, edentula or immature dentition. Good morning. Thank you for accepting this uh, paper. Um, I'm, it's a pleasure for me to represent my team from Barcelona. So I would like to report on three cases of severe alkali burns. All patients underwent osteodontokeratoprosthesis. Um, all patients received living-related donor tooth with blood group compatibility. This was done in the 80s. So we did not have HLA matching back then. And this was done because of immature dentition or edentulia or compromised dental conditions. All uh, surgeries were done by Dr. Temprano, 
The mean follow-up time is 22 years, ranging from 10 to 29 years. So the first case is a 41-year-old Caucasian female. The surgery was done in 1969. Dr. Temprano was just beginning his um, surgeries back then. Patient had bilateral, bilateral chemical burn with lye. The right eye had um, seven millimeter failed penetrating keratoprosthesis and symblepharon. Um, best corrected visual acuity um, on the right eye, of course, um, light, light perception on the right and no light perception on the left. So Dr. Temprano decided to use the canine of a homozygous twin sister that was in 1978. And this is uh, the last picture that we have of the patient in 2004 with OOKP in good condition. The retina is attached, the patient has glaucoma, but has very good visual acuity of 0.9. The second case is an eight-year-old Arab male, seen in 1973, also with bilater bilateral chemical burn with lye, bilateral dense glaucoma with neovascularization and marked symblepharon, Visual acuity in both eyes was good light perception and projection. So the patient received a single canine tooth from the biological father. And this is in 1985. Back then, we did not take out the cataract. So years later, he had bilateral cataract extraction with alpha chymotrypsin. And this is the vision in the right eye, 0.7, and on the left eye, 0.85. But years later, there was bilateral prosthesis extrusion. So in, the 19, in 1990, what uh, Dr. Temprano decided to do was already to use the patient's own canine tooth. And uh, in 1992, the OOKP was well adapted with, in both eyes with no glaucoma and no retinal detachment. And, um, unfortunately, in, uh, he had eventual total retinal detachment in one eye. And the third case is a four, point, four and a half year old Caucasian female, also with bilat bilateral chemical burn with lye, ankyloblepharon, as we can see in the pictures, and completely neovascularized glaucoma. Visual acuity in both eyes was good light projection and perception. And then in 1983, Dr. Temprano decided to do bilateral OOKP using a single canine tooth of biological father, so he split the canine tooth into two for use in both eyes, and this is the visual acuity obtained by the patient in the right eye, 45%, and in the left eye, 20%. But a few years later, there was beginning prosthesis extrusion in the right eye, which then completely uh, extruded, in, and also not only in the right eye, but also in the left eye. And then in 1987, when he already developed the technique of tibial bone capro, that's what he decided to do in um, the right eye, and this is the visual acuity achieved by the patient. However, there was extrusion and ended up in thysis, the patient had glaucoma, retinal detachment, and developing thysis on the other side, and unfortunately lost the eye to absolute glaucoma. So in conclusion, um, OOKP using living related donors may be an alternative in cases of edentulia or immature dentition, dentition to avoid profound amblyopia. HLA match donors for type one and type two probably fare better due to high immunological compatibility and low immune rejection. And probably our best bet would be an identical twin. And this is why, um, after this experience, this is why Dr. Temprano developed the technique of a tibial K-Pro. Because you are using the patient's autologous tissue and there is less chance of rejection. So we believe that tibial K-Pro autograph represents a, as an alternative in cases of edentulia or immature dentition without problem of immune rejection. Thank you. Any question for Dr. Maria? I think the transplantation of a bone, a vital bone of an other patient, uh, is absolutely a problem. 
um, because there are so many immune problems you deal with. Uh, did you did uh, any immune suppressive therapy in these patients? Those who received the tooth from the living related donors, you mean? Uh, yeah. Ah, back then, no, Dr. Temprano did not use immune suppression. I would say that nowadays, if we have, um, we have the technology of HLA matching, we, if we cannot achieve a 100% match, then I think immune suppression is um, indicated in these cases. Because it's not autologous, and we think that these patients would probably have some form of rejection. Yes, I agree with that, yes. So I'd like to ask about the use of OKP in children. Um, I understand that um, when uh, your, your father and your team went to visit um, Gunther, um, you had the experience of two children and then they absorbed rather quickly. So what is the um, uh, experience of the assembled crowd here regarding um, the OKP in children? Um, is it a goer or not a goer? Oh, I think we should, we should go ahead and try to do it because, of course, if we don't do anything, then the, we're, the patient is bound to be amblyopia for the rest of his life. So I think we should be proactive in this case. Yes, something must be done. Uh, but what to do is uh, a very, very difficult question to answer to. But if it's bilateral, then the amblyopia can be reversed, perhaps. Conrad. But I think, I come from another point. I think if you have a child and you know that the Carpro, if you do an osteodontic hypostasis, Gunter Gardner lost them in very, very short time. If you know that you will lose the keratoprosthesis and you, the eye will be damaged and uh, the patient, uh, young patient will not have any benefit from, I think the patient may have more benefit if you help him to live with his uh, impairment of blindness than to have rather several operations and many traumas. That's a very good point, but sometimes the patients would insist on giving their children a chance to see. So it really depends on how you talk to your patients and the parents, of course. In the States, uh, James Aquavella used to do Boston in children, just, just to prevent amblyopia, and even knowing the duration would be short. Have you seen any difference of the incidence of glaucoma between your allogenic patients and the autographed patients? Using? So the patients that you have, you have presented there are very few cases. Few cases. Very, very few cases. No, we did not study that. We took, we, when we published our studies, we took them all. We separated the case we, which were not autografts. Okay. We did not include them in our statistical yeah. analysis because there are very few cases. And a second question. What do you think about using lyophilized tissue? I'd be very interested to try that. Good. Thank you. Okay, so um, we move on, and Dr. Basker will, will now tell us about um, type 2 uh, Boston K Pro. Good morning, everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for giving us the opportunity, especially Professor Fukuda. And uh, I would like to acknowledge the role played by our mentors, Professor Falcinelli. Professor Dolman, Professor Liu, Professor Jodosh, over the last, last 10 years that we've been in the field of keratoprosthesis. Dr. Baska, yeah. do you think you can give your talk without slides? Just a joke. <laughs> I could, but the photos will not be there. But that's true. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's really I think the controversy in children is when you know before the age of five years because I've had kids we've had kids of eight nine years that we have seen with Stevens Johnson syndrome and then now they are 19 20 and we've gone ahead and done the OKP and they've actually gotten back a vision of 6 6 2020 so it's that small group of children who are less than five or six years of age with bilateral blindness where you're concerned about amblyopia and I would feel that if you know you see a child older than that it would probably be wiser to wait till they are older to use their own teeth I mean this is our view but So uh, I'll be speaking on our experience with uh, type 2 keratoprosthesis in chemical injury. I have no financial disclosures to make. As far as uh, chemical injuries are concerned, when you have stem cell deficiency, you have the option of either using a stem cell based treatment as one of the modalities or uh, depend on keratoprosthesis. Uh, when we speak of type 2 keratoprosthesis, we basically are talking of uh, any keratoprosthesis where we are using either the buccal mucosa or the skin to cover the keratoprosthesis to improve the retention. Uh, our experience is with the MOOKP, the Boston type 2, the osteokeratoprosthesis, and uh, what we call as the Lucia type 2 keratoprosthesis. Uh, the Lucia type 2 was uh, basically designed by Professor Shodosh uh, as a low cost variant of the Boston keratoprosthesis. It's a single axial length variation with a less protrusion of the optic nub so that it projects out through the mucosa instead of projecting out through the skin like a normal type 2 uh, keratoprosthesis would project. As far as the surgical steps are concerned, the OOKP could either be done in a two-stage or a three-stage maneuver. The Lucia is normally done in a two-stage where we first drape the uh, buccal mucous membrane graft over the ocular surface and subsequently uh, reflect the flap and place the keratoprosthesis under the flap. The osteokeratoprosthesis is similar to the OOKP done in two to three stages. The Boston type 2 is the only one which, which we can probably do in a single stage procedure, primarily used for patients where multiple general anesthesia or multiple surgical interventions would be an issue. You can actually see the, uh, the nub which projects in the front. When you compare this with the type 2 Boston, this projection is a little bit less. The back plate here is made of uh, titanium which uh, fits into place acting as both the back plate and the locking ring. This is a video showing the assembly uh, of the Boston uh, of the Lucia Type 2. Uh, basically, an, it's a back plate is 8 millimeters, so you can use an 8.5 or 9 millimeter trefine to punch the cornea. The central 3 millimeters is trefined, and the uh, rest of the assembly is uh, reasonably similar to what you would do uh, for a Boston keratoprosthesis. The optic is placed on on a sticking uh, tape so that it is secure. The punched cornea is then placed on top, and uh, the entire uh, and then the titanium locking plate is, uh, is then placed uh, with the help of a specialized glass uh, wrench so that it uh, fits snugly in place. And once uh, the assembly is, uh, is done, uh, you are ready to suture it uh, to the cornea like you would do on a, in a conventional Boston uh, type 1 keratoprosthesis. So when you look at our results, we've, pro we've done uh, about 36 eyes where we've done the OKP, 12 eyes, we've done the Lucia. These have been primarily the main, uh, indication, uh, main uh, types of surgeries that we have done. We have very less experience with the Boston type 1 in chemical injury where we've done it only in one patient. And in three patients, with uh, we've done the uh, osteokeratoprosthesis. The age group has been somewhere around the mid-30s. We've had a preponderance of males in our group. Preoperative vision of almost all the patients was hand movements or worse in the eye which underwent surgery. And about 20% uh, of patients did not have any vision in the other eye as far as the OOKP group is concerned. And almost 50% patients who underwent surgery did not have vision in the other eye in the Lucia group. Preoperative glaucoma seemed to be a major concern in both the groups with almost about 40% uh, having preoperative glaucoma in the OOKP group and about 30% in the Lucia type, one, uh, type 2 group. Uh, we also had a significant preoperative RD with almost about 25% patients with the Lucia type 2 having preoperative retinal detachment. Two patients with the Lucia type 2 had earlier undergone the uh, MOOKP and we had to change or swap the uh, keratoprosthesis because of laminar resorption. And one patient, uh, uh, because of laminar resorption, later on underwent the osteokeratoprosthesis. Anatomical success defined as uh, retention of the primary keratoprosthesis was attained in about 72% patients over a period of follow-up in the OKP, which is around 60 months. And in Lucia, it's attained in about 91%, but the period of follow-up is only around 30 months so far. 
functional success in terms of best achieved vision. We were able to achieve better than 2200 in about 83% patients in the OKP group and about 50 per 58% in the Lucia group. And we've been able to maintain this vision over the period of follow-up in the respective groups. The keratoprosthesis was replaced in, in MOKP in six size. Uh, in two, we had to redo uh, another tooth, and the rest we had uh, swapped with the Lucia or the OKP. We had to remove the keratoprosthesis in four eyes because of infection. Lamina resorption was noted in six patients in the OKP group. And what we call as a perioptic melt, uh, which is classically descri described in terms of the Boston uh, type 1 keratoprosthesis, where the donor carrier, carrier starts melting and you have a leak around the optic, was noted in one patient in the Lucia group. Mucous membrane revisions, basically, uh, in terms of uh, lamina exposure requiring a mucous membrane suturing, was required in the OKP in nine eyes. Whereas uh, in the Lucia, it was an overgrowth of the mucosa over the optic, which needed trimming because the mucosa was a little bit thicker as compared to the project, uh, anterior projection of the optic. So we did publish our paper on uh, the importance of lamina resorption and the methods of uh, salvaging the lamina. This is a video, or a photo of a patient who underwent a mucous membrane revision for a peripheral exposure. You can just mobilize the tarsoconjunctival flap and try to cover the exposed area after drilling and smoothening out the projected bone laminae there. Coming to complications, uh, glaucoma was the primary problem and uh, for patients there was worsening of glaucoma which required a second uh, glaucoma drainage device uh, implantation as far as the OKP group. But we did not have any new glaucoma patients developing NACD. So we started off with 14. We still ended up with 14 uh, patients who had uh, the uh, glaucoma, but four of them it worsened requiring a second tube implantation. And we've published our paper on uh, the timing and the technique of doing an amateur glaucoma valve uh, in the OKP in terms of which stage you would want to perform it and uh, what would be the uh, way to go about. In terms of other ophthalmic complications, endophthalmitis has been a significant concern in about 10% patient, patients in our series. And uh, as far as OKP is concerned, and Lucia, uh, the, the incidence of retroprosthetic membrane was much higher in the Lucia type 2 as compared to OKP where there was only one patient. Just coming to some of our examples, this patient with a severe chemical injury was managed in the acute stage and then subsequently underwent an MOOKP and is maintaining 20-30 in his only eye eight years post-op. This is a patient who presented with severe burns. The right eye was perforated. Uh, we tried to salvage the right eye, we couldn't. The left eye had a skin graft, but we couldn't see anything behind. He had brisk perception of light, ultrasound was normal. We decided to give him a chance. We first uh, did a little bit of lid reconstruction. We draped the ocular surface with uh, mucosa and uh, we were not sure of his vision potential, so we didn't want to subject him to an MOOKP, so we thought we, went, we might uh, try, try to do a Lucia type 2, and we did a Lucia type 2 in him, and he improved to 2030, which he's maintained in a two-year follow-up so far. This is a patient, again, who presented in the acute stage with a corneal melt. The peripheral cornea was thinned out and spongy. There was a perforation. The lens was protruding out. We removed the lens. We did a large tectonic lamellar graft and did a conjunctival hooding. The intraocular pressure spiked significantly. We had to do an amateur glaucoma valve. She was lost to follow up, and then she comes with, uh, with a query corneal infection and a perforation. We did a tectonic graft, and uh, we wanted to cover the eye, so we then we covered it with a buccal mucous membrane graft. Since the per perception of light was still brisk, the pressure was then under control. We decided to do the Lucia type 2, and she's maintaining 2060 over the last two years. This is a patient who's undergone a Boston uh, type 2 keratoprosthesis with chemical injury and post multiple surgical interventions, he's still maintaining 2060 over a three year period. This patient, Dr. Geeta, will be discussing later in her talk on chemical injury. And this is a patient with uh, chemical injury, uh, with uh, hypotony, with total RD in both the eyes, but he still had perception of light and he was very keen to try to do something for his vision. We attempted a corneal transplant with a vitreoretinal surgery in one eye. The retina couldn't be settled and it had to be abandoned. The other eye, we did a PK with a VR surgery. Uh, we were not sure of his vision potential, so, so we left the graft uncovered for the first two weeks. We tried to assess the vision potential in about two weeks' time. He was able to see a little bit with an added correction of around 20 diopters. And hence, we decided to offer the osteokeratoprosthesis for him because we had an issue with his tooth not being healthy enough for us to use for uh, the OOKP. He's about a year now. He's maintaining 20 hundred in his only eye. So to conclude, uh, you could expect reasonable anatomical and functional outcomes with type 2 keratoprosthesis and chemical injury. 
Functional success probably depends on the initial impact of glaucoma and how we are able to control it. Multiple surgical interventions would be needed in the perioperative period in these patients. Laminar resorption still is a concern as far as OKP is concerned, and perioptic melt is a concern as far as Lucia is concerned. We've seen more of retroprosthetic membrane in Lucia as compared to the osteoketoprosthes, uh, to the uh, MOOKP. I would like to thank the team at Shankaranitraale, Dr. Geeta, myself, and our colleague, Dr. Shweta, and the uh, other faculty at Shankaranitraale. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Baskar? Uh, please may I ask, um, the Lucia type 2, is that simply a Lucia type 1 with an extension of the optic? Yes, yes. It's, it's just a Lucia type 1 with an anterior extension so that we have it under the mucosa. It was primarily designed as a salvage for some of the OKP's laminas which were about to, to resolve and, and fall off. So we were, the other, only other option was to just close the eye at that point of uh, time and try to prepare another tooth or look at some other options. Any other questions? In that case, we'll um, close the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher and Jerobani, a nice organizing. And uh, so everyone, uh, the morning session has finished. Uh, the time presses a bit, but uh, the luncheon seminar will start 10 past 12 on time, okay? Just wait for a while.